It's another Followers Worship Online. I'm glad you could join us. I don't know how you grew up, but I think that my parents were big believers in the popular notion of karma. Not the Buddhist version, but the idea that your actions generally come around to either benefit you or bite you in the butt. It's a common parental response. If you had put your clothes in the laundry, you'd have something to wear. You shouldn't pull the dog's tail while he's eating. This is why we don't run on the stairs. If you cleaned up your room, you'd be able to find things when you need them. And those annoying reminders probably helped guide us into better behavior as we were growing so that we learned some discipline, planning, and restraint. But some people stretch that thought into a sort of what goes around comes around idea or you get what you give where good always returns to you and bad always results in retribution. Let's face it, we don't live in a perfect world. Good people suffer. Bad people live in wealth and sin. Rick says, Today we look at the biblical principle, you reap what you sow, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and the way it matters. The saying is sometimes compared to a distant cousin, but it's not in the words of the 80s song, A Karma Chameleon. So we really are a people who need to recognize that we don't live by karma, but by the very grace and mercy of our God. And we're going to start by celebrating that. With you. 
Likewise, when good things are part of our lives, it's important that we not just figure we're getting back some of the good stuff that we've spread around, but we recognize and honor the good giver and his great gifts. Many years ago, the home of a friend of ours burned to the ground. It was a devastating loss, of course, especially because the house was filled with wonderful souvenirs that they had brought home from world travels. But an interesting thing happened. This poor couple had been generous with their friends and family, giving out clothing and furniture whenever they could and always bringing home gifts from their travels. So their friends and neighbors rallied around and began to replace their cherished memories by giving them back souvenirs, photos, and gifts that the couple had given to them. Very literally, these people reaped what they had sown in their community, gaining back many of the things that they thought would be beautiful or of value to their friends. I often think about what they would have been left with if they had been selfish people or hoarders who kept everything for themselves. We reap what we sow is both a warning and a blessing indeed. Heavenly Father, I am your humble servant. I come before you today in need of hope. There are times when I feel helpless. There are times when I feel weak. I pray for hope. I need hope for a better future. I need hope for a better life. 
I need hope for love and kindness. Some say that the sky is at its darkest just before the light. I pray that this is true, for all seems dark. I need your light, Lord, in every way. I pray to be filled with your light from head to toe, to bask in your glory, to know that all is right in the world, as you have planned and as you want it to be. Help me to walk in your light and live my life in faith and glory. In your name I pray, amen. Our reading today is Galatians 6, 1-10. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, which is obeying the will of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. Pay careful attention to your own work, then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we're each responsible for our own conduct. Don't be misled. You can't mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So whenever we can, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Only one.
would crush the curse of sin. Only one was raised to life. As we consider these ideas, it is important to think about what you're sowing today and what you have sown this week. Scripture uses a lot of farming concepts to help people understand truth. We see instructions on how we can plant good things, love, mercy, grace, and peace, and how we can also plant negative stuff, injustice, discord, lies, selfishness, and since we know nothing is hidden from God, he sees all our planting habits. Luke 6 verse 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the verse that gave us our phrase, measure for measure. And it has a lot to do with reaping and sowing. If we behave badly, it's rarely to do only with us. Our bad actions affect others and ourselves, and we will have to pay the consequences. If we do good to others and to ourselves, while we aren't guaranteed a great life in this world, we know that more people will return that good, and whatever good choices we make for ourselves will also benefit us. So, while we never want to connect our good behavior with salvation, because we're assured that we can't earn our way into God's good graces, we can connect that good behavior to the natural response we should have at being saved and blessed in Christ. Jesus gave his lifeblood freely for all. One day he will reap an enormous benefit, an enormous harvest of those who believe. And I hope to meet you there. So plant wisely. Let's share a communion moment here and meditate on the sacrifice of our Savior. He lowers us to raise us So we can sing His praises Whatever is His way He 
makes us rich and poor That we might trust him more Whatever is his way All is well All my changes come from him He who never changes I'm held firm in the grasp Of the rock of all the ages to be reminded of the verse I mentioned earlier, give and it will be given to you and in good measure. That's the way I want blessings from God, overflowing and pressed down. You don't need to look too far to see the needs in our culture. Give wisely, but give. Do 
Deuteronomy 30 verse 16 indicates there are clearly blessings here on earth for those who plant the seeds of kindness, justice, peace, and forgiveness. Scripture says, And I command you today, love God, your God, walk in His ways, keep His commandments, regulations, and rules, so that you will live, really live, live exuberantly, blessed by God, your God. So, be a great farmer this week. Fill your bag with positive, good blessings that you sow for others and seek what God wants you to do on your journey. And now here's Rick with It's No Karma Chameleon. Have a great week. When I first got into television, I knew absolutely nothing about the medium. I was a print guy. But a wise mentor said, look, it's very simple. If you want to understand TV, watch the commercials. Companies are spending lots of time and money to cram everything they can into 30 seconds or a minute. It's the best storytelling in the business. Well, it still is. And to fully and effectively illustrate what we're going to be talking about today, I want to play you an extended commercial from a cell phone company in Thailand. You'll soon understand why. That's a very cool story, and I hope it's based on a true incident because we know things like that really do happen. But there's a lot more at play here. That story hints at philosophical and theological considerations, including undeserved forgiveness, the golden rule, and karma. Karma is something we hear about all the time, but it's much more complicated than people think, and a lot different from its biblical counterpart. A word that simply means action or deed. 
karma is embraced by Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Taoists, and those in the Shinto faith. In some of those religions, karma is closely tied to reincarnation. Simply put, karma is the idea that what you do influences your future. If you do good in this life, good things happen. And if you do bad, you get the same back. Or it could be that the good and bad in your life are because of what you did in a previous existence. So when you die, the kind of life you led here also determines whether you're reincarnated to a better or worse life next time around. Now, interestingly, karma has nothing to do with a divine being. It's not about God or gods. Instead, it's like a natural law in which a person of good actions becomes a good person and reaps the benefits, and a person of bad actions becomes a bad person and suffers the consequences. As a Hindu scripture says, we consist of desires, will, and deed, and whatever deed is done, that we will reap. And a Buddhist scripture goes further, saying, As a man sows, so he reaps. No man inherits the good or evil act of another. The fruit is of the same quality as the action. In other words, you get what you give, and you're responsible for your own bad behavior. If that sounds familiar, it's because Paul writes in Galatians 6, Don't be misled. You can't mock the justice of God. You'll always reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit will reap everlasting life. But despite the similarities, there are some huge differences between the New Testament and karma, and they revolve around free will and what we deserve. Things get really messy with karma. If, for example, you believe in karma and you're doing bad things because of something that happened in a previous life, do you really have any free will and should you be held accountable? Or, if bad things are happening to you because of something you did in a previous existence, should you seek justice or simply accept what's happening as punishment? And if a lot of suffering is just the consequence of things done in a former life, then what's the point of trying to live a better life here and now because you're going to suffer anyway because of what you've already done? Eastern religions have been grappling with these questions for a very long time, and now our culture has embraced a quasi-karma of its own. It's best described as what goes around comes around. But that's not a new idea. Check out this cartoon. It's from 1918. All you have to do is look at the internet to see that people love it when the rude or obnoxious get what they deserve. Whether on the road, or in sports, or when pranking others. That attitude is why a lot of people want God to reward the good and punish the bad right here, right now. And when he doesn't, they get very angry. And on the surface, that seems to make some sense. But do you really want a relationship where every time you're good, God gives you something, and every time you're bad, he zaps you back into line? If you're like me, you'd never be able to stand up to that. Besides, it would reduce our dealings with God to a contract instead of a loving, patient relationship. Just be glad your father doesn't treat you the way you deserve. That's exactly what David says in Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He doesn't punish us for all our sins or deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love is as great as the heavens are high above the earth. 
He has thrown our sins as far from us as the East is from the West. He's like a father, tender and compassionate, for he knows we're weak. So the next time you're down on yourself and wondering how God could ever possibly forgive you, remember, it's not about you and your behavior. It's about God and his mercy. So as Paul puts it, God can point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us. God saved you by his grace, and you can't take credit for that. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For God made us new in Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So, unlike what karma says, we can never earn or deserve an eternity with God. All we can do is accept the gift and respond with grateful, loving service to others. So next time you question your worthiness, just say thank you and shut up. Then set about planting a crop that will yield what the Bible calls fruits of the Spirit. Just before Paul talks about sowing and reaping, he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are sexual immorality, hostility, jealousy, anger, selfish ambition, division, envy, and drunkenness. But the Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Since we're living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. But the Bible does teach that our actions have consequences. In Job, the oldest book in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verse 8 says, Those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. So we harvest the consequences of our actions in this life, not in some future existence. In the Bible, Reward and punishment take place at the Last Judgment, whereas karma is a daily process that determines whether you get good or bad in this life and in the one to come. As for whether or not the Bible talks about reincarnation, the answer is no, not directly. But Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as we're destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many. He'll come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. We get one shot at this. Life is like parachuting. You gotta get it right the first time. So let me give you some biblical advice about sowing and reaping. First, reap what you sow applies to everyone, so don't try to beat it. And if you think that sounds crazy, just look at the number of Christians who think that if they're sinful or just stupid, God is going to make an exception for them and protect them from consequences. That's not the way it works. God gave us a brain and a set of guidelines, and he expects us to use them. Or as somebody once said, it does no good to sow wild oats, then pray for crop failure. Number two, check your seed. What exactly are you planting in your own life and in the lives of those around you? Because if you want to harvest wheat, you can't plant corn. In the same way, you're never going to have peace, contentment, and harmony if you're sowing seeds of discord, envy, and strife. You get what you plant, so be careful what you plant. That means taking responsibility for your own harvest, because what happens to us is mostly due to our own choices. So if you don't like the things in your life and you can't understand why they're there, check your seed. A farmer doesn't get to blame anyone else for the type of crop he or she plants. So don't go looking for peas if you plant pumpkins. Number three, remember that you reap more than you sow. You don't just get back what you plant or all the work involved would be pointless. 
you receive at harvest much more than you plant, whether you sow good seed or bad. Jesus spoke in Matthew 13 of seed bringing forth 160 or 30 times what was sown. One grain of wheat produces a whole head of grain. Likewise, just one lie can produce an out-of-control frenzy of falsehoods and fictions. In fact, the prophet Hosea talks about sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. What he meant was that the idolatry of the Israelites would result in a tornado of consequence and punishment. And that tornado arrived in 722 BC when the Assyrians carried the nation into captivity. We need to be careful of worshiping idols too. But the spiritual principle of multiplication also works in a positive sense. So sowing even a little love and kindness in a relationship can result in a big harvest that lasts a long time. Number four, sow generously in faith, but recognize outside forces may mess with your crop. In farming, the more seed you sow, the more crop you harvest, and so it is in the spiritual realm. God wants us to plant good seed and go way beyond the bare minimum. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about a generosity when giving to others. Remember, he says, a farmer who plants sparingly will get a small crop, but one who plants generously will get a big crop. God loves a person who gives cheerfully and will generously provide all you need, with plenty left over to share with others, producing a great harvest of generosity in you. But look out for outside interference. Jesus talks about a farmer whose crop is sabotaged by an enemy who sows weeds in the wheat to choke it out. So sometimes, Satan and the people who oppose us will do everything they can to ruin a crop of righteousness that will honor God. So, anyway, you're in charge of planting. God will take care of everything else. Remember the rest of what Paul says in Galatians 6. If we sow to please our sinful nature, we'll reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let's not become weary in doing good, for at the right time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. And number five, crops take time, so be patient. We're in it for the long haul. Nothing grows overnight. Every farmer must be patient while waiting for the harvest, and life is like that too. Sometimes growers do everything right and see their crops ruined by floods or hail and it often seems like we're doing what we should, but there's no payoff. More than that, it often feels as if things are even worse when we're more obedient to God. But as we've already seen, Paul says the harvest comes at the right time if we persevere. And Psalm 126.5 says, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Meaning God can bring a harvest of good even out of tough and tragic circumstances. It's all a matter of trust and perspective. And most encouraging of all, sowing and reaping is a powerful metaphor for death and resurrection. When Paul writes about the future, he says death is like planting a seed. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, he says, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but will be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but will be raised as spiritual bodies. So, he adds, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know nothing you do for Him is ever useless. So if you're not already, get some sewing going. And deepen the reaping as God gives you opportunity. It's about realizing that we spurn the yield until we're in the field to answer the call of God.